We're talking about goals and setting goals, and that's what everybody's doing right now with their New Year's resolutions. Mm -hmm. let's, let's just go on the negative side. What's wrong with setting goals? Trust with results you love. Welcome everyone to another episode of Empowering You Organically. I'm joined as always by my co-host Terry and Trevenin. Hey everyone. And we have our special guest back, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. Hey, hey. And today we are talking about setting goals. Before we get into that, let's just read Dr. Susan's bio real quick so that everybody knows that they can trust everything that she's sharing <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson lives in Rochester, New York with her husband and her three beautiful daughters. She is a New York Times bestselling author of Bright Line Eating, The Science of Living Happy, Thin, and Free. She's also the president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss. She is the founder, CEO, and Sherpa of Bright Line <laughs> Eating. That's an inside joke, but she is the founder and CEO of Bright Line Eating which is a company with an unprecedented track record for helping people lose all of their excess weight and live in a right-sized body long-term. She has a PhD in brain and cognitive sciences. She has been teaching at the university level for 13 years. She has been a professor, professor of psychology of eating and a professor of neuroscience of food addiction. Mm-hmm. So listen, thank you for coming back and joining us. We did, for those of you, if you did not listen to our last episode, it aired on December 26th, and we were just talking all about the holidays. We were talking about eating over the holidays, what happens there. We were talking about having self-compassion, and we talked, of course, about Bright Line Eating and what that is. So if you haven't listened to that episode, be sure to check it out after you listen to this one. And of course, share it with anybody that you feel um, could use the information. Also, there will be show notes and transcripts and the video or audio, whatever you're looking for that has to do with this podcast at empoweringyouorganically.com. Let's get right into it. Let's talk, today is January 2nd and we're talking about goals and setting goals and that's what everybody's doing right now with their New Year's resolutions. Mm -hmm. let's, let's just go on the negative side. What's wrong with setting goals or what, what, what are most of the problems that people face when yeah. setting goals? So I think something that, that people get wrong around goal setting is the expectation um, that achieving the goal will make them happier. Like, so let's just consider a couple cases here. Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, right? Like people who um, probably uh, one might say objectively, like reached lots of goals that they might have had at some point and found themselves to be no happier, right? So when we set ourselves up with the expectation that um, we're setting a goal because um, we're expecting that reaching it is going to develop some level of satisfaction, some level of like, okay, now I've arrived and things are better. I'm different. It's different. That's the wrong orientation. That's not what's fundamentally good about a goal or helpful about a goal is that, um, it's a state like a location that once we're there, it's better than here. That's not true fundamentally. Um, and that, reality has to do with something called the hedonic treadmill that no matter um how much better things get they always feel the same <laughs> like no matter where you go there you are right so um what's important is to reframe um the entire endeavor of um of goal setting and goal achievement to be one of improving the journey like we set goals because when we have them the experience of traveling is better. Goals um, give us clarity about whether we're on a path we're happy with or not. They give us um, a yardstick by which to measure decisions and choices. Like, should I turn left or right in this situation? Well, I have this goal. So to be in line with that, I might want to turn left, you know? Um, they make us feel galvanized and motivated. They make us feel happier the moment we set them. And so the, the state of traveling is better when we have 
a good goal. And and we could talk a little bit about what's a good goal because that's an, an important little asterisk there. Not all goals are equal. Talk about it. Tell us. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. So you want what's called a self-concordant goal, which means a goal that matters to you, not a goal that's to impress him or her or to satisfy your daddy or because society says so or whatever. You want to set goals that are meaningful to you by your own standards, your own metrics. And this has to do with like a whole um, sort of self-esteem literature on like um, independent self-esteem. You want to, um, if you're looking to impress somebody, it should be yourself. Like, what do you care about? Um, what kind of person do you want to be? So any goal that, uh, is in line with your best, highest self, that's something that matters to you is a good goal. Right. Um, but a goal that's like something that, uh, you don't really care about, but you're sure that all your neighbors will be impressed by it. Like that's not a good goal. Don't worry about that. You don't need to, you don't need to strive for those things. Right. Yeah. Good clarity. Yeah. And, and I think it, it, it makes a big difference to really understand it. And, and I want to go back to what we were talking about before, because I like the way that you reference the use of the goal, right? Mm. It makes the journey better. It, yeah. it gives you, it, it allows you when you're at that time of um, inner conflict, right? Of do I do this? Do I do that? Do I turn left? Do I turn right? It helps give you that guidance there. Yeah. Let's talk talk a little bit more about that. Let's talk more about goals. Let's talk about how it improves the journey. Um, We've talking about, you know, what kind of goals to set. Give us some examples of some good goals. So let's talk about weight loss because that's my area of expertise. You've got me on the show. Other people can talk about other things, but I can talk about weight loss with a certain level of expertise, right? So, um, losing weight for me was a self-concordant goal. Like I was obese in my twenties you know, overweight before that sometime in my mid twenties, I crossed the line and became obese. And, um, for me, um, I was not happy in that body. Like it just, there was something about it that was not right for me. It was like, um, those extra pounds on me felt, um, they just felt wrong. And it wasn't cause society judged me. It wasn't cause, um, you know, there's skinny women on TV. It was more that, um, I knew I could be healthier. I knew I could look better and feel better. And I also knew that those excess pounds were there because my relationship with food was misaligned. I was eating in a way that was not in alignment with my highest self. It was not being good to myself, what I was doing with food. And those excess pounds were the result, the sign, the symptom of, um, of that way that I was abusing myself with food and I didn't want to be. And I knew that there was, um, some way that I hadn't figured that out yet, that there was a, like, I hadn't cracked the code on like, why do I keep eating more than I need to be eating? Why do I keep eating junk when I want to not be eating junk? Why do I sometimes eat with tears streaming down my face? Wondering like, what, really another pint of ice cream? Like for real? Um, and so for me, the goal to lose weight was, um, it was a self-concordant goal. It wasn't because, you know, I wanted to, you know, whatever, look good to whoever on the beach in a bikini. It was about me wanting to be the best version of myself, like Abraham Maslow, right? And the hierarchy of needs and that top little peak of the, of the hierarchy is, is self-actualization, that drive to be the best version of ourselves that we can be. Um, a goal that like is calling you of like, you need to, and for some people, like I have a friend, Lyndon, um, it's to paint and to play guitar and cello and piano, right? Like her, her heart's calling is to be creative, to produce, not, not because, you know, she's going to like, you know, break in on the music scene and like millions of people are going to hear her records, but because her soul needs to create. Um, so for me, I had to get that weight off. Like it was whenever I would kind of settle into like my best quietest self, it would always come back around to, you got, you got to crack this one. You got to get back. We got to get this weight off. Right. It was the first thing. And you know, now that, that I've been in a right size body for 15 years or so, other things come up for me. I got other goals. Right. But that's an example of one. Right. So, and I can, I can relate a hundred percent. I, I grew up, um, 
chunky is what I'll call it, but if you went to buy pants, they were always the husky ones, right? Yeah. You know, that, that's the nice way of saying you're a fat kid. Yeah. And so um, I grew <laughs> up with, with, extra, with extra weight. And then when I turned 18, I started running and I started my first business. And, you know, I lost weight and I got thin again. Then as my mid to late 20s started going downhill, I started dabbing in some drugs that weren't healthy, started drinking more. Before you know it, I mean, the weight just started coming on more and more. Business-wise, I was successful. I was, I've was i always been very good at marketing. I've been good at starting businesses, running businesses, things like that. And it was just, I mean, five years ago, I was living on a Caribbean island um, off the coast of Panama, Bocas del Toro. And I looked in the mirror and I w- I'm 5'8", and I was 270 pounds. Wow. Totally just not me, right? Yeah. Like, And I knew, and, and at one point, I mean, I had a six pack when I was in my early 20s, right? So I'd gotten to that point. And I know the feeling of like, this isn't me, yeah. right? And you just know to a core, like, that's not who I am. That's not, like, I'm very sad inside, right? Yeah. And and I would drink more, right, yeah. to fix that. I would smoke more cigarettes. A, a big turning point for me was starting a company called The Truth About Cancer and also my daughter's, uh, my first daughter, my girlfriend at the time was pregnant with my first daughter. Yeah. And so when I found out that, that was my big motivator, right? Mm. It was time to quit smoking. It was time to start eating healthy. It was time to do a lot of that stuff. And all of these other times, I mean, that I would go on that journey to lose weight, it was like, yes, I want to look good for me, but it was also, you know, I want to make sure I look good in a bathing suit for them and for women or for whatever, right? It wasn't until it hit home so hard, like I'm not going to be a fat dad, right? I'm not going to be a smoking dad. I'm not going to be something like that, that things started to change. And I'm still on my journey. Yeah. Right. I mean, I weigh just over 200 pounds now. Yeah. Uh, My goal weight is about 160 and I'm still on the way there. And it's been four and a half years. Yeah. And I say all that just to say, like, you know, we're delivering this podcast about getting healthy. And it's not because we're all already skinny or we've all always been skinny or we're all the healthiest, perfect, whatever. We're all on a journey. Yep. And so this is just all about sharing the information to help everybody on their journey at whatever stage they're on. Yeah. So say all that, one, because probably not a lot of people know a whole lot of my story. I'm always a behind the scenes guy. So figure I might as well share that. And two, to talk about, let's say we've tried to set goals. Let's say we've tried to do things, you know, and for me, I'm lucky that I had the daughters there as the motivation, right? That was the big thing. What's a big, what are other things that people can look for? Because we've all, I think, tried it for ourselves at times and it hasn't worked or we've set goals that haven't worked. What are some other tips that we can use? Or is it, are we using goals wrong, right? Are we using goals to measure and try to get somewhere where really we need to look at a lifestyle change? I know yeah. you've talked about something in the past um, with the acronym AIR, A-I-R, about having a lifestyle change. So I'll stop talking and let you share. Yeah, yeah, so much there. Um, I think... Um, I think the goals can often set us down, set us off um, down an unhelpful road because when we set goals and we do them well, we've often heard the acronym SMART, SMART goals, right? And one of the, the M is like make it measurable. S is specific, M is measurable. And so this is where you learn like, you know, don't just say I want to lose weight in 2019. Say, you know, by April 15th, I will, you know, uh, have lost 40 pounds, Uh, or whatever, right? Specific, measurable, whatever. So what that does is it, um, it's an outcome focus. So if you look at changing, um, there's three levels on which you change. And uh, think of it like concentric circles, right? There's the bullseye in the middle, the core, and then there's a slightly outer ring around that, and then the outermost ring, okay? And all three are in play all the time. What matters and what's the difference maker is the direction that you go in. So what, like, where do you start and what's more sort of a, an outcropping or a result and what's what, what's like the core of what you're focused on. Okay. So in the center is identity, um, becoming the kind of person who does X, Y, Z like being that at your core. And in the last episode, Jonathan, you were talking about how you don't smoke anymore and you used to for a long, long time, but now you are a non-smoker. Some kind of identity shift has happened, 
right? Where you became a non-smoker, someone who doesn't smoke a cigarette under any circumstances ever. Um, I think that word you is so important because when he was talking about losing the weight and he's like, all of a sudden I saw my daughter and I didn't want to be that dad, but it goes so much deeper than that. It's your identity. It's not just that your identity is that you're a dad or for other people individually inside what do you want to be independent yeah. of everyone else yeah. and your identity has to be meaningful most importantly to you yeah. even before everyone else because you might not want to be that dad but if you're not happy inside and you aren't right with yourself it doesn't matter what you do or don't want to be for your kids it, it yeah. doesn't matter you will not be propelled enough into that change and into setting those goals that are meaningful even if you've got this outside influence and i think outside influencers to some extent can be good, right? Seeing your kids and saying, I want to change, but you still have to do that core work. I just love that you said the word you, your identity for you has to be what it needs to be before yeah. it is for anyone else. Yeah. And shifting identity is an interesting thing, right? Jonathan, do you have a sense of when your identity shifted from smoker to non-smoker or what that process was like? Can you remember? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I remember it was right around, well, it was right around July 15th um, four and a half years ago that I quit. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell a little, a, a couple parts of the story there. I mean, I know I quit cold Turkey and one of the things that helped me stay cold Turkey was actually reading about quitting cold Turkey every single day until I no longer needed to read about it every day because I was thinking about it less and less. Um, it, it was, it was, it had to have been several months after. I mean, I know once my daughter was born, my first daughter was born um, October 7th, uh, 2014. I think at that point, like there was zero going back at that point. And I think at that point, I mean, I was really clear that I was a non-smoker. I think up until then, I mean, I, as you're going through the transition, you're still, you're still fighting, yeah. you know, you're still tempted. You still think about it. Yeah. You see somebody on TV smoking, you're like, I got to turn this movie off. Yeah. There's a smoker in this movie, and he's going to keep smoking. <laughs> I'm going to keep wanting to smoke, and I'm not watching this anymore. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that's a good point. The identity shift is touch and go, and it it's um, I I often think of it as like building a brick wall. You know, after it's built, it seems pretty solid. You yes. know, but it went in one brick at a time. Exactly. It's like one day at a time, and there's an interplay between you putting the bricks. And you watching yourself put the bricks, which is a slightly different thing. Like you watch yourself do differently and you come to believe over time that you are the kind of person who does differently, right? Yeah. right. I think that's so interesting. Like just going back to there's a, that outside influence that kind of propels you into like, I want mm -hmm. something different, but you felt that internally already. And then you have to do that work inside of like, this is the next step. This yeah. is the next step. Nobody can do that for you. Only yeah. you can. Totally. So let's go back to the concentric circles. And before I finish talking about them, I just need to give the nod to where this idea comes from. Um, uh, we all stand on the heads of giants and blah, blah, blah. It's actually a series of ideas that has a long history. But in particular, this articulation of it comes from James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Awesome book. Recommend it to the nth degree. I want to read that book every year for as long as I live. But anyway, uh, so he, he talks about this specific idea. Identities in the center. The next rung out is the systems and processes that we use. So that could be bright line eating if you wanna lose weight or it could be whatever, keto, paleo, I'm running a marathon, whatever. It's the systems, processes, and so forth. And then the outest, outermost ring is the outcomes. I wanna lose 40 pounds by January 15th, by April 15th, I wanna, uh, whatever it is, outcomes, it's um, measurable. But, like that's where most people's goals live is in that outer ring, right? But um, the key idea here is that you wanna start in the middle and move outward. You wanna be focused on changing your identity and then think what systems, processes, behaviors, habits will get me there. And then the outcomes come as the result of that. So I'm always nervous when people in my tribe say to me, like we have an annual live event um, in San Diego, usually in the summertime, and they'll say to me, I'm gonna be at goal weight in my right size body by the next live event. And I'm like, careful, sweetheart, you got no control over that. I would way rather you say, I'm gonna be committed 
to bright line eating, to being a bright lifer, somebody who does this every day, and I'll see you next year at whatever size I'm at as the result of that, of being that person, right? Because you got no control. Like you can, you can affect the, you can change the food you put in your mouth, but you can't change directly what the scale says tomorrow or the next day. That's an outcome. We can't control outcomes. And this is just a big like life lesson, right? We can affect the things we can affect. We can change our behavior. We have control over what we do. We do not have control over, you know, what spins out from that, you know, uh, in the universe, right? Like things happen. We're not in control of outcomes. We're in control of our actions. So, you know, I, 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 I kind of like goal setting. Like I think it can be helpful. It can be exciting. It can be motivating. I definitely still sometimes set goals. Like I got a goal. I'd love to do a pull up before I die. Um, I'm pretty far from that right now. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> if I put my little knees on the little thing at the gym and like, I, I need We're going like to test it right after 60 this, by pounds the way. of assistance. I'm like 113 pounds and I need like half of my body weight assisted to do a pull up. I never, never even come close to doing a pull up. It's, it's like the first thing on my bucket list. I want to do a pull up before I die. Right. Okay. So that's an outcome, right? That's, that's a goal. But what I need to be is the kind of person who doesn't miss workouts. Right. That's the identity. Right. And then it's like, okay, what kind of systems or processes? It could be like, okay, I got a, I got a pull up bar, you know, in my bathroom, like door jam. And every time I'm going in or out, I just hop up there and I do some negatives. I just hold myself up there as long as I can. And then slowly lower down, that would be a process or a system. And if I, you know, if I change my identity and then I've got a good process or a system, eventually I'll do a pull up. Yep. Right. So, yeah. I think, I think it's, I like talking about this and, and I can relate it back to the smoking because you do ask, when did the identity change? I mean, in my mind, I had to be a non-smoker day one, right? Or, or you're fighting I, for or that. I would have smoked, Yeah. right? So, so I was fighting like, yes, yeah. I'm a non-smoker. Like, yeah, even if I didn't believe it. Yeah, there's a part that, of you that believes it and there's a part that doesn't. Exactly. It's like you live in had to keep telling myself for a little bit, right? And but it's, then it's like, it's which one until, lives? It's a fake the until you make it though, isn't it? I mean, for yes, me, like even in totally. business, I started, I dropped out of high school um, after my junior year. You dropped I moved out of high Texas. school? Yes. High five, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I've ever had a high five for that, but I'll take it. <laughs> well, yeah, we got us, us like crazy successful people who dropped out of high school. We got a band together. Exactly. I have a PhD though. No one asks if you graduated from high school when you have a PhD. That's an, interesting, a good point. that's an interesting point. That's a really good point. You would never think that. Nope. Tie the two together. Yeah. I furthest I got was a GED, and it wasn't even for me. So, <laughs> but I, I dropped out of high school and I started my first landscaping business. And a lot, a lot of that at the time was a fake it till you make it thing. I mean, I was going out there knocking on doors, quoting landscaping jobs against master nurserymen that had all kinds of education, that knew what they were doing. And it was, hey, I was going to come there and do the work and I would make sure I did it right and, and they were going to get it good. But, you know, you, you do have a certain amount of like, in my head, I had to tell myself all these things, right? Yeah. I had to fake it till I made it. Same totally. thing with quitting smoking. Same thing with, with losing weight. Right now, I, I, I'm on a 5K a day challenge with myself where I get up and I run 5K every day, five days a week. Um, and But it's it's changing the identity of me of being a runner, yeah. right? Which I uh, clearly wasn't running at 270 pounds, yeah. you know? And so it's, I, I just, I love as we talk about this, relating it back to my life. And I'm sure a lot of the listeners can look at that too, Right, you may be in a, a place in your life right now where, or there may be areas of your life that you're not happy with. There might be areas that you're super successful, but there are ones you're not happy with. And just think about those successful place, the the areas of your life that you are successful, and how you got successful there. Mm -hmm. Right, and likely it would be following what you're talking about today. Yeah. So, totally. I say all that just to say I, I get it and I understand it, and I like the idea of getting rid of. You know, for me, it's like got away 160 pounds. Well. That's not fair, right? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I might get to 170 and love how my body looks and that's where I need to be, right? Yeah. And then am I a failure because I didn't hit 160? Right. No, but I succeeded because I run five days a week and I'm eating healthy and I'm doing this and that and the other. Can I ask you an interesting question? Please. So when it comes to goal setting yeah. and your journey yeah. and where you've been... You know, and you talked about being in a certain, you know, place with your body before. And now here you are. What, what did you say? 15 years later, yeah. you've been at this point. I've been rocking size four jeans for 15 years. So people make the statement, the way you do one thing is the way you, you do, do all everything. things, yeah. right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And when it came to that conquering that battle for you yeah. and that becoming your identity, that yeah. you were a thin, healthy, in your body, the right body kind of person, yeah. obviously you have to make a lot of shifts to be there. But do you feel like when you were in that place for yourself, that that wasn't the only place in your life that you had to tighten up? So when you set a goal, like I'm going to quit smoking or I'm going to be a healthy eater and change your identity in that way. Did yeah. you feel like you had to change a lot of things in your life? Like, do you feel like a lot of things were tied to that as well? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. For me, no. So, and I think that uh, a lot of people would have a different answer to that or a different experience yeah, for themselves. Yeah, for sure. For sure. For me, I had already um, – kicked drugs and alcohol and had mm-hmm. been working the 12 steps rigorously for eight or nine years. Mm-hmm. Um, I was wrapping up my PhD in brain and cognitive sciences and had gone through all the personal growth needed to like face the dissertation, you know, malaise and like, oh my God, I haven't been working on my thesis for whatever. Like that took a, you know, um, I had already um, gone through major transformations in my spiritual journey. Um and uh what else like um for me the food was this one last like the last missing link that wouldn't snap into place and i was like i'd already like it wasn't in her no there was nothing else yeah. it was like <laughs> just the food yeah i just that was like the to... last mi- missing link for the, yeah. the quote of the way you do one things is the way you do yeah. all things so but my question around that ties back to goals yeah so you had already learned how to set goals in a meaningful way for you because you were fulfilled in a lot of ways in your life a dissertation you said spiritually you were on track yeah and things like that how did you have to shift in your goal setting to overcome this last really big hurdle to be exactly where you wanted to be in all aspects of your life what did goal setting look like for you in that context with your knowledge and where you are with goal setting and where you were in your life what did that look like for you you know, the first answer that comes up for me, Tarianne, is I had, to, it wasn't a goal setting thing. It was around living. It was like being the person. Uh, it was like being a person who doesn't eat sugar, being a person who doesn't eat flour, being a person who gets enough support from a network of people who are living healthy in right sized bodies, mm-hmm. um, who are swimming upstream not eating the way everyone around us eats, right? Everyone around us is eating crazy. Our society's whacked when it comes to food. So um, it was not about goal setting at all. As a matter of fact, um, after I uh, solved the food thing and got thin, I didn't set a New Year's resolution for at least 10 years. January 1st would come around and I would just laugh and I'd be like, I'm the person I want to be 360 four days a year. I'm not, I'm not doing anything different because it's January 1st. I live the way I want to live. If there's a change that needs to be made, that might be on May 12th or October 2nd, or, you know, there is no thing about January 1st. January 1st would come and go and I would not feel like I needed to change a thing. I was the person I wanted to be. Yeah. It's interesting. So do you do in your life, do you still set goals or do you feel like I change and shift things to be the person I want to be because you've overcome that aspect of your life? Do you think people grow outside of that or do you think people always need to be setting goals just from your personal experience? It's going to be different for everyone, but I'm just curious in light of what you said. I, I hold that one loosely. I sometimes get in like a real goal setting mode and I like to just yeah, like list them out. And I got a bucket list. I've been updating it really regularly right now in Evernote and stuff. Um, and I'm kind of more in a goal setting mode these Mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I got to watch it because again, the, the, the real magic is in being the kind of person, um, who travels the way you got to travel to get to those places. It's not Small about shifts every single day. That's right. Do you think that it happens for a lot of people? Like for people who are listening right now, do you think goal setting is a good starting place for people? And then slowly as they set goals the right way over time, they just become intentional with their life. And it's not even so much more about setting these huge goals, but it's becoming intentional with what you do every single day. Does that make sense? Kind of. I mean, if someone's inclined to set goals, it's January 2nd. They already did, right? Like right. <laughs> yeah. you probably For already sure. have it, right? right? So what I would say is look at that goal and then ask, what kind of person do I need to be to have this goal manifest in my life at some point down the yeah. road, right? Like what what's my daily commitment to what 
habit process system and to being the kind of person who follows it. Cause the goal is going to be an outcropping. It's going to be a result. It's not, it doesn't come first. It comes last. Yeah. That, I, I relate to that so much. And I love what you just said about your life and for you that weight loss wasn't a goal. It was, you wanted that to be a part of your life. It's where you wanted to be. It's who you wanted to be this person. Yeah. And for me, when I think about goals, I work very hard every day to be intentional with my life. This is what I want today. This is where I want to be. And goals come as a result of knowing where I want to go, but I've done the work to know where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And then those goals come about. You, I think you can set much more meaningful and intentional goals when you have that clear path of this is who I am, identity, this is who I want to be. And then the goals fall into place. This is my next step for me. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting. I relate to that a lot. Yeah. Both looking at me, so I guess I better say something. <laughs> so we did, at, didn't you know, we? we got deep into a conversation. Break. Wait, he's still here. I, still here. So, you know, I, I do want to talk about things because it is January second, and a lot of people have set goals, and uh, we've all been through ups and downs. I've been very successful when it comes to business and things like that. There's other areas that I still struggle to to find the right balance in my right center on um, weight being one of them. And I think that, you know, let's just talk about things in general. I mean, there's there's likely people listening that are have set a goal to quit smoking, right? Mm -hmm. There's likely people that have set a goal to make more money, that have set a goal to lose weight, that have set a, a goal to do all kinds of stuff. Weight loss is the number one. Stati I, I, by I, a lot, statistically I, speaking. Yeah. I um, that. Yeah. Well, not ideally, statistically. It's right. just the number right, right, one. Right, right, like right. More <laughs> people are setting that New Year's resolution than any other. By yeah. a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why the gym is packed on January it 2nd. It is. And yeah. it will be cleared out again by February 15th. Yeah. <laughs> statistically. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. By March, we're all on our second diet of the year. Yeah. Statistically. Yeah. So with that said, I think it's really important for us to understand that I don't think that you shift your entire life at once. Right. And I actually think that sets you up for failure to go in and take on everything. This mm. is my personal belief. Right. I know that whenever I've gone into to making a change in my life, it's not like, OK, I'm going to get up and I'm going to run every day and then I'm going to study for eight hours and do my business. And then I'm going to go do this for two hours. And like before, you know it, I've scheduled out 16 hour days that that fix every yeah. negative part of my life. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> because that's not how it works. It's overwhelming. It's not sustainable. Find that one thing. What's the one thing for you that's going to that's going to matter? And that's what I was going to come back to. I, I don't know why I said ideally, because statistically that's a number. For a lot of us, that's losing weight. Make weight loss be the only thing yeah. this January 1st. If you're going to make January 1st that whatever date it needs to be, that line in the sand, yeah. right? Then just tackle weight loss. Because that's enough, man. I mean, no <clears throat> exactly. one's succeeding at that, right? Like if you could actually lose your excess weight and keep <clears throat> it off, you would be a unicorn, right? Like I've done it and I help people to do it. But if you look out there... 99.9% .9 of people who aim to lose weight will not keep off weight, you know, get, get down to whatever they're aiming for and sustain it. They won't. So, so you're so right. I mean, just to conquer that would be, you know, And amazing. then it's going to be a snowball effect, right? You for conquer sure. that. Now, now you wake that. up every morning, you look in the mirror and you're happy. You feel better. Happier by, by how you look. Yeah. Right. Well, also happier because of the foods you're eating Sleep are better. conducive to happiness. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, it, and then it's going to make it easier. So it's I, called I, a keystone habit, Jonathan. So yeah. the, there are certain habits that first, and they're different for different people. For me, it's my food for sure. For me, my food is on track. Everything's on track. My food is out of whack. Everything's out of whack. Like end of story, right? Other further for James Clear, it's exercise. Uh, so it could be sleep. It could be exercise. It could be food. Usually it's one of those physiological sort of things. Um, and so you, you ask yourself, like, what what's the thing that when that's on, um, it has a positive ripple effect on everything, right? And food and weight, that's a big one. So for a lot of us, yeah, it's going to it's gonna cascade out throughout our lives for all kinds of reasons, right? Some of them physiological, some of them psychological, um, some of them sort of behavioral day, structural, uh, yeah, but getting your food and your weight right, boy, it has a big impact. I mean, I, I can't even tell you the, the, I can't even language the, the changes I see in people, you know, like you were 270 pounds. We have, um, you know, I was just reading in my bright lifers community, this woman who, um, you know, she used to travel the world, but she was above 300 pounds and she would always buy two plane tickets, the, the one for the seat next to her, right? She'd sit 
And, uh, you know, and then she stopped flying because she just couldn't, the seatbelt extenders and the whatever. And she's now in a right size body. She's lost, you know, 170 pounds or something, whatever. And she took a picture of like the seatbelt around her lap and like this, like these yards of extra seatbelt, like the fabric of the seatbelt, right? Was, it was clicked around her waist. And then there was, there was all this length of extra seatbelt wow. of her tiny little, you know, legs and waist in this tiny little seat. And there was someone sitting right next to her and, you know, like, um, she's like, yeah, here I am on an airplane. I haven't been on an airplane in years. It's my first flight since I lost my weight. And, uh, here I am a whole new life. So let's, let's dive deep then on weight loss. And I'm going to ask you to reveal your biggest secrets around it. Like sure. what, what are people right now They're, that that's their goal to lose weight? Give me, give me the best of the best, right? Let's, and I know on our last podcast, we talked about the four bright lines. If, if you could repeat what those four are for you inside of bright line, you need, but then also, I mean, just share some more of the really nitty gritty stuff that people usually have to pay you a bunch of money to find out. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. So the four bright lines are sugar, flour, meals, and quantities. Um, bright lines are, are an approach really that isn't right for everybody. Bright lines are like clear boundaries that you never cross. Like if you're going to quit smoking, you're not going to ever have a cigarette, just no exceptions under no way, no how doesn't matter. Friday night party concert doesn't matter. You're not smoking. Right. And, um, a lot of people assume that that kind of approach is unrealistic or not helpful for food. And it turns out that that's wrong. Uh, it turns out that for some of us, it's the only way. Just like we couldn't quit smoking, allowing ourselves a, a puff, a drag here and there, um, we can't get fit and healthy, you know, repeating that one piece of pizza experiment ad, ad infinitum. It doesn't work for us, right? One piece of pizza leads to another. Like, let's right. be real, you right. know? Um, and it's actually easier and more freedom producing to not eat it at all, to just practice the no thank you. I don't eat pizza you know? Um, and so that's bright line eating. It's like for those of us who have brains that are highly susceptible to addictive foods, um, there are certain foods that we just are better off if we leave them alone. Well, I, statistically cold Turkey is the most effective way to quit any addiction. True. Right now it may not be the healthiest, right? If we get deep into like heroines or even some, uh, pharmaceutical addictions, things like that. The it may benzos. Not be. Yeah. yeah There's certain you, things you can die if you the, the, yeah, quit, the, quit so the cold turkey. Alcohol is, if you're, if you're super addicted. Yeah. Exactly. But statistically speaking, cold turkey has the best success rate. Yep. Right. And, and it's hard to think that because as you know, an ex smoker, I wanted to, well, let me just cut down to 10 a day and then five a day and then two yeah. a day. Never worked, right? <laughs> let me just do an e-cig. Same thing with food. Yeah. Right? It's like you got to draw that line in the sand, that bright line yeah. in the sand, if you're somebody with that addictive personality, right? Yep. Again, I, I talked on the other episode, There's, I had smoking buddies that would just have one a week and they'd be fine. Yeah. They weren't me, right. right? So if you're addicted to food, it's an it, you've got to draw those lines in the sand and just you just don't do it. Yep. So no to sugar, any kind of sugar, right? Yep. Um, no to flour. Yep. And then your other two meals, like yep. no snacking or grazing. Perfect. Um, just eating meals, uh, ideally breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay. And then quantities. So um, I weigh and measure my food with a digital food scale. We just had lunch. You yes. watched me. I yes. put my food on the scale. Um, and some of that is um, to make sure I eat enough vegetables. Very few people will eat enough vegetables if they're not weighing it out. And then also it's to um, get just have really clear boundaries around the meal so that that little whispering voice doesn't say, I don't know if that was enough. Maybe you need a little more, right? Because a little more leads to a little more. And before you know it, you've overindulged and like where, you know, ugh, you know, because you can eat you know, quote unquote, allowable foods or bright line friendly foods, you know, whatever, um, you can overeat them. And then, you know, you've just like, basically you don't want to be setting yourself to eat three troughs a day. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, so, but you need to eat enough, right. So that you can make it to the next meal. So most of us have no sense of how much that is. By the time we need bright line eating, it's like those sensors are broken. So yeah. So sugar, flour, meals, and quantities. Now you asked like, what are my ninja tricks? Well, um, okay. I'm sorry for all you folks who are launched off on your weight loss resolutions and you're hitting the gym, but okay here, if you want the straight truth, exercise doesn't help you lose weight. 
Not if you've got a real weight problem. If you're someone who's like, you know, your weight's crept up 10, 20 pounds and you were always pretty fit, you were an athlete in school, great, go hit the gym and get those 10 pounds off, awesome. But if you're like, you, have, you got a serious weight problem, you need to focus on your food. What you weigh is about what you're eating. And you cannot outrun, outlift a bad diet. You just can't. And furthermore, when you throw a bunch of exercise in the mix, you set your brain and your body up for demanding more fuel for all those workouts, right? And you put yourself in a really unwinnable position. If you think I'm wrong about this, I just ask you to look around. How's that strategy working for us? The whole diet and exercise thing. Not so great. In Brightline Eating, we say put your bunny slippers on, let yourself rest, and give yourself a set of weeks and months to get your food really clean and automatic, like really focus on your diet. And then once your food is automatic, like brushing your teeth, great, go back and hit the gym, not to lose weight, but for all the other great reasons that we should all be exercising for cognitive function and sex drive and self-esteem and cardiovascular function. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I know the science on exercise. Exercise is amazing. You want to be exercising, but not during the period of time where you're getting that weight off and getting an entirely new relationship with food built. Because if you throw exercise into the mix there, you will not have enough willpower on board to set up the food habits right. You'll build in exceptions, little allowances here and there that then become hardwired into the system. And six months, a year, four and a half years later, you'll still be like not quite at your goal, wondering what the hell happened and why you can't get these last 10, 20, 40, 70, 80 pounds off. I love that you said that. I think it goes in line with the one thing at a time, right? Let's not try to change your entire life around at once on January yeah. 1st and take on all of these different things because we all know willpower is not enough. If it was, right, we'd all be skinny and healthy and right? you know millionaires and all of that other stuff, <laughs> right? But willpower, it runs out, you know, it lasts a few days, a few weeks, whatever it is. Why... Spread your willpower thin amongst five different things that none get accomplished. And next January 1st, you're setting the exact same goals again. Totally. And right? Jonathan, here's the thing. We think of food like eating and exercise as the same thing. Diet and exercise. Right. Like we've bundled them. How did that happen? They're completely unrelated. They are not the same thing. So get that exercise out of it. You want to lose weight? It's diet. It's about the food you're putting in your mouth. Like I want people to uncouple those in their thinking. I want, like if someone has eaten too much, I do not want them thinking, I gotta go for a run. I want them thinking, gotta clean up my food. Food is related to food and your weight is a food problem. It's not an exercise deficiency. Yeah, I mean, they always say abs are made in the kitchen, right? There you, you go. Know, they're they're exactly. not made in the gym and- Ask the, ask the bodybuilder, Absolutely. right? What do you gotta do before competition? How do you get cut? It's right. not about sets and reps. It's about food. Yep. Yep. And it's sure. the 80-20 rule, right? So, I mean, eight, making sure that I do this in the right direction, right? 20% of that effort is going to give you 80% of the results. Yeah. And so you could be exercising a whole bunch and not mm -hmm. get the same results as you would if you just cleaned and, and still eat crap mm -hmm. food, yeah. right? You're not going to get the results as if you just fix the food, yeah, right? Totally. And left the exercise out. The later. trainers will tell you, the personal trainers are like, you know, I can't help you. Like I can yeah. give you a good workout, but honestly, it, what, what your goals are, it's a food thing, you know? Like, yeah. So all of you that just signed up for the gym yesterday or the day before, <laughs> you may want to go back into the gym and just see if they'll let you pause it for three months. <laughs> And uh, and get save your, your money <laughs> save, totally, yeah. and get your get your eating in check. I mean, this is this is a big thing for me. I mean, I, I'm I'm listening right along and learning from you. It's it's one reason why I wanted to have you as a guest. So yeah. all selfish reasons over here. Yeah. Um, what are some more ninja tricks? Because I think that one was phenomenal. So um, let's talk about meals for a second, because there's this widespread confusion around like, you know, eating several small, several, several small meals a day, meals and snacks, keep your metabolism revving, protein shake mid after whatever. And um, no, the research is very clear on this. Eating fewer times a day is better for weight loss, for health, for all kinds of reasons. And I could go on, I could talk about this for an hour, but um, so first of all, in terms of weight loss, 
the only way, if you have had ever a weight or a food problem, the only way to solve that is to create behaviors of eating that are automatic. They become wired in like brushing your teeth. You cannot rely on willpower in the moment to make good choices for you day in and day out. The brain does not work that way. So, um, for that reason, many small meals a day is a catastrophe. It's like expecting yourself to be able to brush and floss six times a day, regularly, habitually, without failing. Like, I'm sorry, but I, you know, when I finally learned how to floss in my 30s, I was so proud of myself, like to add the flossing to the brushing, but twice a day is max, right? Like there's no way that I'm brushing and flossing six times a day. Right. Because you can't expect yourself to stop at the right time and do it. You can't have it on you. You can't be motivated. Like there's just no way, right? But brushing and flossing twice a day works because of the time of day cues and the way that it gets wired into your routines that happen morning and night, right? Food is the same way. You you only want to force yourself to stop and eat at these clearly demarcated times when meals become sort of obvious and are happening. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it's all you want to be eating. I feel like I eat that a lot of times I eat that way too. I'm not a big snacker and I feel like on days when I'm snacking more, and this may be different for everyone, I eat more and then I want to sure. eat more and because it, it's just that habit of I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat. Okay, here's something, I'm going to eat it. And <laughs> yeah. I, I love eating three times a day. That works for me yeah. and it's just you have time to plan out. Like I'm going to eat this for breakfast. I'm going to eat this for lunch. I'm going to eat this yeah. for dinner. You get your meal, you go on with your day. You're not snacking in between thinking about food, always thinking about food, yep. always thinking about food, always thinking about food. Yeah. Six times a day is a lot of thinking, a lot about, of food. thinking about food. It yeah, is. It really is. And especially when you talk about the addiction side of it, mm -hmm. that's a lot of eating food throughout a day. Totally. So I'm not addicted to food and I've never had that problem, but I love the three times a day rule. It works so well for me it and does. it's just a, healthy balance in eating your meals. And something you pointed out, Terri Ann, is so true. It's like eating more times is like eating more food, yep. right? So we're all struggling with weight problems here, like 80% of us now. And it's like, in what world are you thinking that giving yourself license to eat all day long uh, is a good idea? Yeah. Like, no, yeah. you should yeah. not be eating anytime. Yeah. For yeah. me, it's that willpower, right? Six times a day, I have to make healthy choices. No. no. Like, why not That's just give me one totally meal or two hard. meals a day? So I only have to make that choice once or twice for me personally, right? Yeah. That, 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 that works. It was, it's the Fewer. same as when I quit Fewer smoking, times. right? I'm not going to hang around with people that smoke, no. right? While I'm trying to quit smoking. I'm not going to put myself in a situation where there's cigarettes around. It's the same thing with food. Yeah. Don't put yourself in that situation where there's food always around or where you're always going yeah. to, you know, trying to eat that many meals a day. The no thank you. You get, you just got to wire in the no thank you. If it's not meal time, you're not eating. It doesn't matter if it's healthy, unhealthy. You don't even have to think about it. It's like three in the afternoon. You don't eat. No thank you. You know, no thank you. I, I'm yeah. trying to think what... I'm sure it was reading, it was probably a Tim Ferriss book, Four Hour Body, or I was listening to one of his podcasts or something. And he just talks about, do we even know what being hungry feels like anymore? Right? right? I don't think that we truly do. Yeah. I mean, yes, you might feel a little bit hungry. You're probably dehydrated and need to drink some water. Right? But I, I think he was referring to, you know, well, what do I do on a travel day if I'm going to go be in the airport all day and there's not healthy stuff? And he's like, just don't eat. Like, when's the last time you actually felt hungry? Yeah. And it just, yeah. it just brings me back to that when we're talking about how much we eat throughout the day and all mm -hmm. of that. I think that we have really fallen into a routine of just eating. We just yeah. eat. It's that totally. addiction. It's well, emotional. We're always, it's, we're always it's eating on that. the go too. Like we don't sit down and chew our food and think about I'm chewing food and it tastes yeah. good and you're methodical about it. You're just shoveling food in your mouth to be on to the next thing. Think about if you're eating six times a day, how fast you have to eat through each <laughs> meal. Like it really is insane when you think about it like that. But you know, it's just, it's crazy that we don't even enjoy our food anymore. We yeah. just rush through it and we don't say, oh, I'm satisfied now. I'm not going to eat yeah. the rest of this. We eat the whole plate and then we run and we're like, oh, I'm stuffed. So, That's another issue I think a lot of people face is not enjoying your food, chewing it. And guess what? You probably don't need to eat every single thing on your plate. Do you feel satisfied? That's a huge key, I think. Yeah, so that works for you, Tyrion. So you're low on the susceptibility scale. Your body tells your brain, like, I'm satisfied, and then there's, like, a, um, a natural desire to stop eating that comes from that. I don't get that. So um, you don't either, Jonathan. Nope. We're tens on the susceptibility scale. What happens for us is 
Um, sometimes we get no signal that we're full and it's time to stop eating. Sometimes we get a signal. It's like vague. It comes from the belly. Like I think I might be full, but for some reason it's not paired up with an actual like uh, wanting to stop chewing and eating. Like the mouth still wants to go and the brain still wants to go. We still want to bend the elbow and put more food in our mouth, even as our stomach is saying, kind of stretched out over here, feeling pretty full. It's like, oh yeah, but that was good. And maybe if I had another bite of that, that would be good. And now we're switching from salty to sweet and sweet back to salty. And like, we still want to eat. So the question of like, am I satisfied? Uh, it only works for some people. Do you feel like over time you've never gotten to that point where you eat a meal and you're like, I feel good. Like, that's all I need. No, I do. Yeah. Uh, not reliably enough to, to live in a right size body. Is this why you weigh your food out? Yes, totally. So question, real question. Do you ever go out to eat? And if you do, how do you weigh your food? I'm serious. Yeah. For people who have to live all the time. I travel like a, whatever. I travel all the time. I eat out all the time. Um, there's lots of different strategies. I have a whole, like in my bright line eating bootcamp, I have a whole module on all the different kinds of restaurants, how to handle each situation, how to eat out in a Japanese restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, a Thai restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, a Mediterranean restaurant. Um, sometimes I'll weigh my food in a restaurant. Usually not. Usually I'll eyeball my quantities. Um, and, um, I, I know the categories of foods that I eat like categories like protein, vegetable, fat, uh, fruit, like that. And um, what that does is it narrows my attentional focus as I'm looking at a menu. I'm not thinking what most people are thinking when they look at a menu, which is, what do I feel like eating right now? That's what most people are thinking. What sounds good? What do I want to order? I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking, where are the vegetables that look clean and good? Where's the protein? Okay, and then what kind of fat would I have on that? That dressing sounds like it might be a little sweet. I'll see if they've got you know, the crafts of olive oil and balsamic vinegar. I'm looking for my food categories Mm -hmm. and it, it puts blinders on a little bit and literally from a psychological standpoint, I don't even see the pasta section on the menu. I don't read the dessert menu. I I don't read the dessert menu. Exactly. Cause it's not, it's there. It's not in my categories. I'm not even seeing it. Yeah. And then you don't even know that it exists. Exactly. It's not in your field of vision. So I eat out all the time, but it is, I mean, for some people who start bright line eating, they avoid eating out for a while because it's like why would I be around the smokers right that, that was that's what yeah. I was going to say is I mean yes you've been doing this for 15 years so you can right. eat out and that's easier I can go to a bar now and it's yeah. fine and I can do that when I quit smoking I wouldn't even consume any kind of alcohol uh-huh. I couldn't have any wine I couldn't have anything because that was a trigger too yep. so not only would I not go out anywhere because I didn't want to be out around people and, and be triggered to smoke but yep. I, I wouldn't do other things that mm-hmm. would trigger that and mm-hmm. I would imagine that's the same with almost any new habit you're trying to create why right. put yourself in a situation right. where it's easy to break that habit yep right so just eat at home totally for, for the next month or two and, and get under control yep. and then slowly eat out slowly exactly. do these things and bring them into your life and make sure that you are remaining in control mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i mean i just terry i just okay i just flew from rochester new york to london to catch uh the prince for you concert that was doing its last uh last show of the world tour i flew in for a night to catch that concert then i flew to washington dc to have a lover's getaway with my husband for a couple nights there went to another concert went out to eat we spent okay i'm not even going to tell you how much money we spent on dinner for two nights eating out i ate, i ate out every meal with my husband in washington dc so breakfast lunch dinner breakfast lunch dinner breakfast lunch and then i flew here uh to dallas to be with you guys um hit a whole foods grocery store on the way here um, got a bunch of groceries and stuff, but like, it's like an eight day whirlwind tour, London, DC, Dallas, back home to New York. Um, and I'm going to weigh exactly what I weighed when I left. I'm not gaining an ounce and, um, I'm enjoying every last minute of it. There's no hit to my, um, relationship satisfaction, my experience in the world, my joy, my whatever. I went out to eat and enjoyed it like I used to. I didn't eat dessert. I didn't have um, bread. They brought over, they were bringing over French fries for free or whatever. Like we don't need those. They took them away. Um, But I ate some, you know, some food that was pretty freaking sexy and delicious by my taste bud standards. And I enjoyed every bit of it, you know? So it's like, you know, you recalibrate your 
uh, you recalibrate and I, you know, food is uh, one of life's pleasures and I enjoy it more now than I used to. And I don't have to shrink the way I live in the world at all. But like you said, Jonathan, it's been a process. I've been doing this for a long time. And yes, I made my world a little bit narrower at the beginning just to keep myself on the beam and let those habits gel. Right. But you should, right. Yeah. I mean, set, set yourself up for the win. How many years have we not done what we should have, I hate the yeah. word should, but have we yeah. made choices that did not, you know, serve us. Did yeah. That didn't serve us. us yeah. Right. And, and so to don't go and expect, okay, well, I'm going to fix 10 years of bad choices, 40 years, 50 yeah. years, 60 years mm -hmm. in, in a month yeah. Yeah. or two months. And, and, right. and, 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 oh, I'm not going to fix it without sacrifice. It's going to take some sacrifice. How long That's did right. it take you? You know, you probably can't just pinpoint a certain spot, but how many years was it before you felt like I enjoy eating and it's not a chore for me to make good decisions and do what I need to do to feel good all the time? You know what I mean? What yeah. Did, when did it become enjoyable for you instead of all the time thinking, you know, and I know you're still very intentional. You think about what you're going to eat, you weigh it, but you know what I'm saying? That shift in your mind of like, I, this, I own this and it's fun for me now to eat because I don't have to worry about what choices I'm going to make. I have that bright line like you talk about. Okay, so change is an interesting thing. I had moments, Tyrion, that were like within the first week or two or three where I was like, hey, I'm loving this. Wow, this yeah. meal tastes great. Like, for sure. I, well, I'm someone who does responds, this now. Right? Oh, yeah, that was amazing when watching the, scale the weight. responds, and it's like, oh, yeah, you know, that salad oh, yeah. does taste good. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's intoxicating. Weight loss is intoxicating for sure. And this is some of like, you know, what Brightline Eating does that's ninja is we help people maintain because once the weight stops melting off, because like you're there already, you're in a right size body, psychologically, that's a different phase where yeah. you're not seeing the motivation of like, I lost some more weight. As a matter of fact, now you're staying the same. How do you get comfortable with that? But you're, back to your question, um, Terri Ann, um, in the brain, um, change is like um, taking a, a, a river of water that has been grooved over years. These are fiber tracks in the brain. The, bra the, the currency of the brain is electricity and it runs in these networks, these like cables, these fiber tracks in the brain. And they groove, they wire up with association with behavioral experience. And it's like, it's like electricity flowing. It's kind of like electrons flowing through a, a copper wire and, um, and they groove up, right? It's like river. It's like a river, water in a river. Now, if you want to change that, you got to dam the water upstream and divert it into a new pathway. And when you do that, it's like water flowing over dry land. There's no groove yet. It's just awkward and it's like wandering and meandering and it, but you keep the dam firm upstream and you let that water flow in that new pathway. And then over time, the water grooves a little bit of a riverbed and over more time it grooves more of a riverbed. So when you ask me, like, how long did it take for it to start feeling different? My answer is, well, it was gradual, right? I had moments of feeling different kind of from the beginning. And then there were other times where it felt strange, awkward, constraining, depressing, scary, whatever. Yeah. And then the, the, the water flow, flowed in this new pathway. And yeah. over time, you know, I had more and more meals, moments, times where I felt like I got this, right? Yeah. I had a feeling you were going to say that. And I, I, I wanted to ask that because I think a lot of people now think it should just be instant. It should be instant, you know. Well, everything just, else want, is instant, if, right? I can go to instant. Amazon and you buy want, everything instantly and have it yeah. delivered tomorrow. And, and it, it goes back to the lifestyle conversation and this gradual change, you know. We yeah. talk about quitting things cold turkey, and that's fine. But then to stay on that path, yeah. you have to make continually make those changes and those mm -hmm. decisions to be there. You have to reaffirm it's a, that it's identity. It's like a lifetime process that's fulfilling totally. for you. Totally. And we can't, with, with food, we can't underestimate how much we're herd animals and how much, um, we will behave in ways that are reinforced and normative within the group of people that we hang out yeah. with. Right. So yeah. if you're going to keep hanging out with people who eat like crap, you're gonna, uh, your habits are going to devolve back to that old way. Right. So you got to form a new community. You got to be around people, um, who are like traveling and like stopping off at a grocery store. Cause we don't, you know what I mean? Um, you got to hang out with people who, you know, it's Thanksgiving, but they're not just going to eat, you know, every last crappy thing. It's not all about the pie, you know, where it's like, Hey, can I bring the big salad? Um, yeah, sure. That'd be great. Can you bring enough for 10? 
Um, and um, so in Bright Line Eating, we make sure that, um, you know, if your friends and family that you've got now aren't going to be that community, we supply the community because you're going to need to get reinforcement from other human beings. Otherwise, you won't change. You just won't. So let's let's focus because we're about to to wrap up the episode. Let's focus more about Brightline Eating. Um, so one brightlineeating.com is a website people can go to to learn more about that. B r i g h t l i n e eating.com. You can also go to empoweringyouorganically.com. We'll have links to all of Susan's different pages. You also have a video series right now uh, called Reboot and Resume, and it's very relevant to this time of year, right? We're talking about the new year. We're talking about resolutions. We're talking about change. This is a free video series that's not usually free. So go to, where could, do we know the URL offhand where they can go and watch this? So go to empoweringyouorganically.com. We'll have a link there in the show notes and on the page. Go check out this video series. It's life-changing. Go check out brightlineeating.com, especially, I mean, for everybody here and 80% of the world has some sort of challenge with weight, right? So I know you listening, if you're shaking your head, no, not at yes, because that's you too. Go to brightlineeating.com. <laughs> Except for the Terry <laughs> <in> the <world>. <laughs> <laughs> Go to brightlineeating.com and learn more about this. I, I mean, I love you have different um, names for, you have your bright lifers, right? Yeah. These are people for life. and. It's true. These are the people you want to surround yourself with, Mm -hmm. right? Don't surround yourself or or I'm not going to say don't because some of us don't always have choices, right? Your coworkers, your family, things like that. Consider adding more people into your life Mm -hmm. that will influence you in the direction where you want to be, right? right. So you want to be healthier, then go find a community of healthier people, um, which you'll find at brightlineeating.com. If you want, you know, anything else, go hang out with more people like that. You want to make more money, go hang out with some more business people. You want to do different things like that. Um, For today's conversation, we're talking about weight loss. What are some, what's, is there any last tip you want to leave for people yeah. here at, before we sign off? Yeah, I want to, I want to cover just the, the reframe of Reboot Resume because it. it's January 2nd. Um, and, and so people have, a lot of people have launched off with a resolution, right? And, um, there is a way that <clears throat> we set ourselves up for failure. 91% of New Year's resolutions will not be achieved by the, by people's own admission. They will say, I did not succeed at that New Year's resolution. 91%. That's a huge number, right? And, um, I want to presence, um, the flaw in our thinking as we start off that sets us up for that kind of merry-go-round of uh, turning over a new leaf and then falling off the wagon, turning over a new leaf and then falling off the wagon over and over again. And here's the flaw in our thinking. The flaw in our thinking is it's going to be different this time. I'm really committed. I found the silver bullet. I've got the program, the system, the approach, and I'm doing it. I'm all in. And the idea is that like with enough motivation and enough oomph in that sort of rocket launch, in that sort of thing, that we will be different from now on and we will, it's almost like the uh, Hollywood happily ever after expectation that at the end of the romantic comedy, the two, the, the man and the woman have decided that they're actually right for each other. Now they're going to get married and now the movie ends as if like, well, now it's perfect, right? They're about to get married. So it's done. <laughs> it's over, right? Like sure. <laughs> <laughs> as if the beginning of a marriage is a guarantee of happily living, you know, living happily ever after. So um, the reality is that life always shows up and perfection is not available. So the question is, how do we think about it as we notice ourselves having veered off track? And the answer is that if we expect it to happen, we know that relapse is always going to happen. Relapse, lapse again. Here I am in a period of lapse. Why? Because my mother-in-law is in the hospital, because my daughter has an ear infection and I'm driving to urgent care and that means I'm not going to prep my food for tomorrow because, you know, um, I just twisted my ankle and I can't hit the gym for two weeks, right? My New Year's resolution was to work out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, blah, blah, blah. Well, all right. Well, I got a bum ankle, so I'm off track for a while. Relapse. Lapse again. It's always going to happen. Expect it. So the solution to the launch off and then crash and burn, restart, fall off the wagon, is to 
expect those cycles, but to smooth off the edges, right? Like, and we do that by interrupting the shame spiral. When we notice that we're off track, it's not like we've blown it forever and ever. And, you know, it's all ruined now. And we have to wait for some new motivation to start some other system program, New Year's resolution. No, no, no. Stick with the one you were on. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be unstoppable, right? So get a little bit of support to get back on track and start a resume cycle. Relapse, resume. Relapse, resume. Relapse, resume. It's what you do, Terry Ann, with your food. You're a naturally thin person who's low on the food addiction susceptibility scale. And what you do is when you relapse a little bit with your food, you naturally resume. You go, oh, I got to get back to my center. Ain't no thing, no catastrophe. I'm not a bad person. I'm not like, there's no issue here. This is life. We relapse, we resume. We relapse, we resume. And over time, you become a ninja at those cycles. That's what it is to live in a right-sized body lifelong, is you just become a better steward of the relapses and the resumes. Instead of being like, now I'm just going to eat bad for 15 weeks and start <laughs> over that. You know what right. I mean? That's, that's, that's truly the heart yeah. of it though. Like, yeah. Like it's here okay. it is October. Nobody starts a diet in October. We might as well like, just wait till January 1st. Yeah, right. Course. Exactly. Right. Plus Halloween. Exactly. Free yeah. candy from your exactly. kids. Exactly. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Valentine's Day comes around. It's like, oh, I just ate all this yeah. food and I didn't keep my resolution. So I'll just start in the summer when I need, yeah. you know, in May when I need to get yeah. into So the how shape. of yeah. that is what's in my Reboot Resume video series. Like, how do you become a ninja at those relapse resume cycles? But I think even just hearing that, that the expectation is not perfection. The expectation is you got to become a person who does it differently and people who do it differently. It's the AIR that you, that you presenced before. Maybe we can close with that again. Yes. Automaticity, identity, resume. Those are the components to living happy, thin, and free in a right-sized body forever. Whether you were born with it constitutionally, like Terry Ann over here, I keep picking on you, <laughs> or you're like me and Jonathan who have to fight our way through it the hard way, we have to become someone who has automatic healthy habits, who has the identity of someone who just doesn't eat that crap because that's not who we are. And when we veer off track, we resume. Automaticity, identity, resume. Essential is air. Love it. This was an amazing show. Susan, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you guys for listening. Go to empoweringyouorganically.com for the transcripts, for the show notes. Share this episode with anybody in your life who you think uh, could benefit from it, which we all know there's at least 10 or 15 or 20 people we know. <clears throat> we have Susan on here. We are not affiliated. We don't get any kind of compensation. There's no payment here. We had her on because she is the leading expert in the world when it comes to weight loss, when it comes to uh, psychology around eating, when it comes to just getting healthy. And so we are so honored that you came and joined us today. Thank you. Go check out our website, brightlineeating.com and become a bright light for yourself. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you. And we'll see you on the next show.